point of all this stuff, right? It's just like we're having fun and figuring it all out. Yeah, I think it's cool too, but I just, I don't know. Sometimes I get these new toys, you know, and like yeah, I, and you I want to play with, around with it too much. Yeah. Um, great, man. Well, look, thank you so much for, for doing the show with me. I, I really appreciate it. Um, I've, I've said a few times, and I've mentioned this on almost every podcast that I do, but I always feel like it's worth repeating that when I started doing my podcast, I kind of approached it as like a way to sort of market my website because I do a lot of writing and just a way to sort of market my brand. And what it's turned into is almost a way for me to have like these super genuine conversations with people that like I wouldn't really normally talk to and without all of the distractions that come around and without like people looking at their cell phones every five seconds and it's turned into like a really a really great experience for me just meeting new people and learning all of these interesting stories and like having a, a chance to have these conversations with people and uh on that note like I, I wanted to just open with that because this is really the first time i've done a podcast where like i know basically nothing about the person that I'm going to be speaking to, you know? So like, I'm super, super looking forward to having a chance to have this conversation with you. And, uh, and with all that, like, thank you. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, no, man. And thank you very much for, you know, letting me come and kind of talk with you. And and I think it's, uh, that is exciting when you have those moments where like, we're genuinely going to be learning about each other in the conversation. And I think it's really cool. And, um, you know, for myself as a, uh, you know, I'm a television producer. That's the normal nine to five. That's what I do. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's times where, uh, you know, in television, you get so used to everyone needs to have a purpose, right? Like what, what is the point of this segment? What's the point of this interview? What's the point? Um, and I think sometimes we get so caught up in like making the point or in making sure that we're teeing somebody else up to talk about their yeah. book that's coming out or talking about whatever it is that we do. We, we often miss just genuine human connection and the ability to like learn something from someone else and, and not always feel like um, every conversation needs to lead to something. I think, you know, especially for me out here in Los Angeles um, in a lot of times people are so caught up in their careers and they're so caught up in moving forward and pushing themselves forward that everything, like every contact, every night they go out, every dinner, every coffee, like every single time it's this like, oh, I'm stacking to move my career. I'm climbing this ladder. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you can do that and that's fine. And it's good to be ambitious and have those goals. But at what cost, if you're completely missing all of these little opportunities to just genuinely connect with people. So uh, I'm excited too, man. I think it's going to be, who knows where we'll end up. Yeah. (laughs) And I've, uh, I think this is like a really cool place to sort of, sort of open the conversation because you're, you're absolutely right. And I, I have to admit, like I started the podcast with that intention, you mm-hmm. know, and then I started maybe seeking out people that from like a marketing standpoint that could help you share and like yeah. guests that um, would bring like an audience into the the work I do. And it's just strange how, I've found in my life, and actually this is probably like a good teeing off point because you could probably sort of run with this concept as as it, it seems in the, the few conversations we've had, that uh, the more genuinely I approach it, like the better it does anyway. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm almost better off starting from a position of just trying to learn about somebody and like trying to see how I can help them and like how I can be of service to them. and then. I don't know, like the universe is weird. It, it sort of spins it all around in some way where when you bring that kind of energy to a conversation into a situation, it just takes off for you. Um, so even even with that, that is a good teeing off point, but let me not get too far ahead of myself because I'm sure people listening to this are wondering like, hey, who is, <laughs> who is this guy? Who is yeah. Philip Barb? Uh, what is he doing? You are a, uh, you're Emmy nominated, you're a producer. Tell me a little bit about yourself. Uh, yeah, definitely. So I am, um, I get into a lot of weird stuff, man. I've always kind of been a little bit of a high energy guy and I've always been in love with, with entertainment. Um, and so for myself, you know, part of my story is I'm originally from Metro Detroit. Uh, I grew up in a little town called Melvinelle, just on the Southwest border of Detroit. Um, you know, graduated, uh, graduated high school, went to Michigan state university where I studied television and film, uh, with the ambitions of always moving out to California and never knew what that meant. 
didn't know if I what I wanted to work in. I just knew I wanted to to be in that realm, you know, be in entertainment. Uh, when I was 17, I started DJing and because music had always been a passion of mine and entertaining people. And uh, so that was something that, you know, I've kind of continued. You know, I think it's funny when you, you know, I just passed like 15 years of DJing and it's like crazy wow. to be like, I can't believe I have anything, anything that I've been doing that long or, um, sure. you know, and so for me out here on a, on a, from a month to month basis, you know, I'm, I'm a television producer working primarily in uh, reality television and documentary series. I just mm -hmm. finished a show for uh, Facebook watch, which is a new, you know, their new kind of platform. Yeah, like their platform, right? Exactly. So I, I just finished a show for them. Uh, I'm getting ready to move on to a show for ABC. And uh, so that's one, I've got that element, right? And then I've got the DJing, which is just fun, you know, like, and I'll do everything from nightclubs and, and bars and things like that to like, you know, little Jimmy's bar mitzvah. Hey, everybody get to, you know, like, you know, doing that type of stuff and weddings. And then, um, and then I also have developed um, a speaking and coaching practice. Uh, and a lot of that has come out of uh, you know, I was starting to do as a TV producer, I was working with people, helping them to be better on camera. Uh, so always helping them be able to talk a little bit better, fine tune their message a little bit better. And right. uh, so that was something that I kind of always was doing was in this media coaching realm. Well, because of, and I'm sure we'll get all into this, but because of my, my background in, uh, you know, recovery, substance abuse issues with things like that, I started to realize that for every one or two people that needed, they just needed practice. And the reason they weren't good on camera was just because they hadn't done it a lot for mm -hmm. every one or two of those. There was eight that the reason they weren't good on camera was because of some deep rooted insecurity and things that were coming up from childhood. So it was like the first time they raised their hand in class and they said the answer and they got it wrong and everyone laughed and they were like, I'm never doing that again. I'm never you know? doing that again. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and so it's like, uh, so it kind of started the media coaching then kind of shifted a little bit into doing some life coaching and uh, and then the speaking kind of came out of a lot of things with uh, recovery, you know, so I started speaking at, you know, I started speaking at rehab facilities and, uh, you know, would do that, would speak, you know, obviously at, you know, AA meetings and that different type of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I've, you know, recently got into, you know, speaking at jails and I've, you know, spoken at USC and Michigan State University. And so it's kind of, you know, there was a moment in time where I, I kind of had a moment where I started to freak out and I was like, man, Phil you're doing so much and I'm passionate about all these things, but am I spreading myself too thin? Am I not going to be able to really get into any of these things because I'm so scattered? And then what I had to realize was for a while, I was trying to keep all of these things very separate. I was trying to keep the speaking, the, the guy that was speaking different than the TV guy, different than the DJ guy. Cause I was afraid that people would see me and be like, Oh, well, this guy's just all over the place. He's just scattered. And then what I really started to look at was like, no, like, I'm Philip Andrew first, like that's at the top of the pyramid. And then everything is, everything kind of scales out from there. So I don't have to be, I don't have to be, you know, ashamed isn't the right word, but I don't have to be worried about doing all of these different things because they're all things that I'm passionate about and that I love doing. And when I really look at the mission for what I wanted life to be, I just wanted life to be like, and it, it taps into just exactly what you were saying, service. And I learned so much about, you know, AA and recovery taught me so much about the importance of service and to a point where I've started to draw a line between anytime I'm, I'm curious or nervous about something, or I don't know how to approach a situation. I always say, all right, Phil, are you being people pleaser right now? Or are you trying to serve people? And I draw two very distinct lines and it's like, I'm either doing one or the other. And if I'm trying to people please, I'm trying to sound cool and I want to say the right thing. And I, I want to make sure my hair is perfect. And I'm really hoping that you guys will think I'm cool and want to. And when I'm there, I'm selfish. I'm in self. I'm worried all about me. I'm all concerned about how I look, how I sound, what, you know, how do you think about me? And that doesn't put me in the best place. So when yeah. I check myself and I'm like, no, I don't want to be people pleasing right now. I want to serve people. And it always puts me in a mindset that just like helps me be able to say, how do I really want to show up? in this next conversation, in this next talk, in these next 15 minutes, how do I want to show up? And I'm like, I want to serve people. And that always gets me out of myself. And it just kind of helps me, uh, you know, cure the anxiety or, you know, neuroticism or the craziness of my brain and just really put other people first. And it always helps. Yeah, I can, 
completely relate to that because because when I started my site, I I think I even had a, a quick conversation with you about it. I felt like I didn't know which which side of me to like portray, you know, mm -hmm. because there's a side of me that that has his past and a lot of people know about, you know, me being in recovery, but there's also a side of me that like doesn't want to make that my identity. Sure. And I'm into other things, you know, like I'm I'm into the online marketing and I, I really enjoy like just making content, whether it's like video or podcasts or like writing blogs, you know. I'm also really into to fitness and exercise and like that's a passion of mine. And uh I mean other things. I, I'm I'm like a huge comic book fan, you know, and like people make fun of me for that. But but I was struggling when I first started doing this on I I don't know exactly what the word, but almost like picking a message and like mm -hmm. delivering that message because that's what you want people to see of you. And then it took some time and it took some practice to eventually just be like, look, my message is that like, this is just who I am. And that might pull a little bit from this side and like that might pull a little bit of talking about fitness or, you know, sometimes I talk about like space because I've been really interested in the stars since I was a kid and, and how all that works. And for me, that's only really come through like time and through trial and error and just kind of doing things and then realizing, oh, that didn't quite come out right. And then doing something else and realizing like, yeah, that, that felt good. And, and, and I think you're right with that where, you know, you get in your head and you, you try to, you try to think of like, who is it that I want people to think I am? Mm -hmm. As opposed to just being like, this is me and I'm a lot of different things all at the same time. And like I'm just gonna put it put it forward for you, and I think uh, being able to touch on that. So I, I think really what I'm saying is I'm not the only one that feels that way. Yeah, you know, everybody has some kind of like identity thing that when they speak to people, especially if they speak to people in groups, uh, they're not exactly sure how to portray themselves. And I think if you can help people sort of like find that that comfort that they're not the little kid that got made fun of when they were raising their hand in school, um, that they can just be themselves. That that comes across that energy that you portray when you're just like comfortable being yourself really is obvious when you meet people. And in your particular situation, I'm sure it's obvious when you're on camera, when you're trying to train somebody to, to be on camera. Yeah. I, and, you know, we see it a lot of times with, um, you know, with actors, you know, like mm -hmm. actors will get in their head about, you know, who do you want me to be, right? Like I go in mm -hmm. and it's an audition and I'm like, okay, like, who do you want me to be? Like, how do you want this character? And sure, there's like times where you'll describe a character and you let them know. But a, a big thing is, you know, it has to be a part of you. It's how you can look yeah. at certain actors and be like, oh, they play the same character and everything. Well, yeah, because it's part of them. You know, like there's very few actors that are that amazingly skilled that they can transform themselves completely and make it believable. And usually when they are, it's because they're kind of yeah. <laughs> out of their mind. So exactly. We've and, seen that a lot. And so we see one of those things where it's like, you almost have to, it's not about like turning yourself into this character as much as it's like allowing you to come through, through that character, yeah. like you being comfortable and understanding. And this was something that took me some time to understand, but I cannot be all things to all people all the time. Yeah. There are going to be some people that will, I will, my message, me talking, I will never resonate with them ever. Whether it's where I'm from, how I talk, what I look like, there's going to be some people that I'm not their guy. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. You know, and that's what I, I think, you know, I, I, there was times growing up where you want to be, you want everyone to love you. You want yeah. every, you know, because you, because the problem is we end up focusing, we can have a hundred people in a room like us and the five that don't. And those are the five that we pay attention to. That you, that you go home thinking about. Exactly. You know? And so it's like, once I started to understand and really just own that and be like, you know what? All I can do is stop trying to, like I said, stop trying to please everybody and just be me. Know my message. Only, only talk about the stuff that I know. Only talk about things that I'm passionate about and that I understand and I actually have a, in a, an opinion on. And like, the, I'm going to resonate with some people and those are going to be my people. And then there's going to be people that don't resonate with me. And luckily, there's a, other people for them. You know, like I don't have to be 
all things to all people all the time. And when I finally accepted that and started to own that, it was like a huge weight off my shoulder because yeah. I could stop trying to, you know, I, I could stop wondering like, Ooh, like, what are you thinking? What do, oh man, like what, what's going to be the best with you? How is this going to work? And, and obviously like, you know, you know, in marketing and things like there has to be some, you have to have some sort of an idea of mm-hmm. what you're going after and who you are. But there's a point where it's like, you know, you hit that moment of, you know, diminishing returns where you spend so much time focused on becoming something that you're not. Yeah, and people and don't can actually feel that. get anywhere. Exactly. And people can feel it, you know, like we're, we are being marketed to and lied to and it showed a fake world all day, every day. All day long yeah. that finally, when you see someone that's being real and authentic, it's like amazing. Like it's all we, you know, like that's what we really resonate with. And it, it sounds like that's what you've, you've found and you've experienced. And that's why people, you know, keep coming back and listening to you. And that's why they, you know, appreciate the job that you do because, because of that, because you're authentically you and you're comfortable in your own skin, you know? Thank you. I, I, I think there's definitely some truth to that. I mean, I'm still a person. Some days are are better than others, you know, and it's not like, I, I would like to be able to let people understand that that journey of like discomfort is okay too. A, A thing that I really, really believe in, and this is something that I've learned through a lot of different experiences, but mostly getting sober and also through like fitness um, because I I enjoy fitness things. I'm not necessarily into like bodybuilding, um, physique type stuff. I'm really into actual fitness, like things that hurt, that challenge me. And I've discovered that growth in all different areas is just a painful process. Yeah. No matter like how you're trying to grow, if you're going to get better at something, it usually sucks to have to like go through those experiences of, of failure. And I mean, anything, if you take acting as an example, I mean, geez, acting, especially if you're failing in front of people, you know, like, yeah. that, oh my gosh, I just got anxious thinking about that <laughs> feeling, you know, but the thing is, there's no other way to get better other than to make yourself vulnerable and to be like willing to feel a little bit of pain. And if there's one thing that I hope I can portray is just the willingness to do it anyway. Like Mm -hmm. a theme that comes up on my podcast over and over again is hit publish because a lot of people ask me questions about, you know, building an online following. And I say that you have to be willing to make bad stuff in order to eventually like make the good stuff because it's not all great like never i've never seen any instance where everybody just made like these brilliant gems over and over again like there's a whole lot of shitty stuff that has to get made before you get to the real gems you know and i i think that the willingness my my parents taught me this at least the willingness to be able to like endure pain and go anyway like whatever your definition of the word pain is and just keep doing it anyway I, I haven't found a, an easier or I haven't found a way around that, at least I could say. And I, and I think that, that that has a lot to do with um, why I've done well for m- myself. And, you know, again, like your definition of the word for, for me, that means what you talked about, being comfortable in my own skin. You know, like if I have gotten to that point where I wake up most days and I feel pretty good about who I am, it's simply because I've been willing to endure the painful process of growth. Yeah, I think, you know, you you kind of talk a little bit and it almost kind of at a, in a little bit, it taps into like perfectionism and like how often. So, you know, we we have this idea that we want to be perfect. You know, yeah. we want to be perfect at things we want our website to launch and it'd be the perfect website or we want to put a video out or a blog out. And, you know, it even, you know, it's funny for me. So, so, you know, for a lot of people that if you have listeners that aren't in recovery, but generally a lot of times when you get into AA, uh, you know, normally about six months in, you kind of tell your story. Um, You know, like people will have you come up and you talk a little bit and you'll, you know, maybe be on a panel or whatever. And that normally happens around six months, eight months, you know, maybe a year. The first time I gave my testimony, it was five years into recovery. I never gave because I had so much. I had wanted to speak 
for so long that I had built this moment up in my head that I was going to be perfect, that yeah. I was going to give the, the most, you know, it charged talk and people would be crying and doves would fly and the, you know, the heavens would open up and, you know, and I had this because I, I wanted it so bad, but I was so focused on And it was like this idea of like, well, you know, I, if I'm going to do something, I'm going to go hundred percent at it. I only do things if, you know, I'm going to, I'm, I'm a perfectionist. And like, that's not a good thing. Like, you know, like the, at least for me, it's not a good thing. Like mm-hmm. I will, I will hide behind perfectionism. And what it really is, is just me being scared. You know, it's me being scared that if I really put myself out there and, and it doesn't go as well as I thought it was, then I've shattered this idea I had in my head of who I really am. When the truth is what I finally had to get through was like, I, you know, I wrote a mission statement for my life. And one of the lines in there is in acceptance of struggle, hardship, and failure. And it's like every day I read that. And it's like, I accept that struggle, hardship, and failure is coming regardless of whether I do everything perfect, which is impossible. Or, you know, it's like, I have to know that those failures, those struggles that like the hardship is, it is necessary. 100, like you said, for growth, for me to move forward, to have progress. Those things are so important for me to be able to move forward. And so when I wake up every morning, every single morning, and I say those words, a part of my mission statement that I am accepting it. So then when it pops up in my life, it doesn't rock me. You know, it doesn't auto, it doesn't make me start questioning like, man, should you even be speaking, Phil? Should you even be doing this? What makes you think that you're, what makes it, what makes you think that you're not just some idiot kid from Southwest Detroit? You know, mm-hmm. like what makes you think that you have anything special to offer anybody? Who are you? And like all of those limiting thoughts, I have to accept that like, that's part of being a human. Those things are going to pop up and I need to make sure that I check, I really identify when I'm being a perfectionist when I'm, you know, tapping in and I'm in, in really seeing it for what it is. I'm just being afraid. My faith is being questioned and I'm not mm-hmm. being as strong. And then it's like, all right, well, how do I move forward? Oh, didn't you already say, Phil, that you knew this was going to come? Didn't you already say that you knew that you were willing to accept that struggle was coming, that failure was coming, that hardship was coming? Yeah. yeah. Well, now it's here. Okay. So let's keep going. <laughs> and it's that, and it's become that simple of when things really when you hit those roadblocks, when you feel, you know, when you get stumped, it's like, no, dude, there's that. I knew this was going to, I knew this was going to come. So we move forward. Yeah. You, you mentioned like personal mission statement. I think that's a Stephen Covey thing, right? Isn't that in his, one of his books? Um, Oh, I I haven't, I think so. I mean, I know a lot of people have, um, there's a lot of people that talk about doing mission statements for your life. Yeah. You know, it's, for me, it was, you know, I guess it's, you know, from a business standpoint, right? Like if you and I, you know, if you and I started a business and we created a mission statement of what that business was supposed to be all about, the idea behind the mission statement is that when we are in 10 years and 15 years, maybe in a hundred years, if that business is still going, when a decision needs to be made and we don't know what to choose, we can look at the mission statement and we go, okay, which choice is on point with our mission? So it helps guide us so that we know how to make the right decisions when we don't necessarily know what it, what we should be doing. So for me, yeah. I wrote a mission statement and, th- and it's just that. It's like when I ever have moments in life, if I'm like, should I do this or this or what's smarter? or How should I handle this situation? When I look back and I look at my mission statement and I go, I reread it and I go, okay, what of my choices right now is in line with my mission statement? And it keeps me pointed in the right direction. Yeah. You know, it keeps me remembering like where I'm really trying to go in life. Um, and uh, I was, I was terrified of it for a long time, man. I wanted to write a mission statement probably for four or five years. And yeah, I think a lot of people probably would be because then it's, my dad always told me that it's not a goal until you write it down. Yeah. You know, because then when you write it down, it's almost like you're making a contract with yourself. Yeah. And, and then at that point, the, you, you, if you're veering off course, you could tell yourself, you know, some kind of lies like, oh, well, I did it because of that. I did it because of that. But then there's still that thing where like in your mind, you, you know, and my fiance said something to me, which uh, struck me 
as well when it comes to writing. She said it's it's really really difficult to lie to a notebook. There's just something about it, you know. Like if you're gonna write something and you're writing something that's bullshit because it's like an insecurity. Like, are you really gonna do that? You're just gonna write something that isn't true yeah. because you know that that's what you wish it were. It doesn't work that way, you know. There's just something that's like, uh, I, I don't. I guess honest is the right word. There's there's something that's makes you that's disarming about writing in a notebook where it's like okay to say what the truth is and then yeah i think people are, are also in in the same regard a little bit afraid of that i think that you have a lot to offer in the few minutes that i've been talking to you um if I appreciate you that, man. thank you yeah I, I can just tell that when you talk to enough people you know when people have kind of like rehearsed their act a little bit but then you yeah. also know when they're uh they're they're saying it not only because they believe it but because they like are intentional about the actions that they take and you just seem yeah. like a very intentional person um if we could i i'm, I'm sure that we're going to kind of intersect with it all but i i'm also very curious as to just that kind of lifestyle of of being in that kind of business and show business and how is it difficult to maintain like that open self-reflection in an industry that is so uh that relies so much on portraying a specific yeah. identity and message do you see that a lot with the people that you work with you know i think that i will say with 100 percent honesty like i know that my recovery has helped me so much in being a great producer because it you know, like when you go into a meet, like there's, when you go into meetings or when you go to recovery and you hear people telling the truth, like exactly what you just said, you hear enough people that are authentic and vulnerable and really give it that, you know, when someone's being full of it, dude, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I feel like in, in the industry, like I've never really had any issues with, I've never felt, um, you know, a lot of people get nervous about like, oh, well, networking, like I don't drink, like, how is that going to work? Do I need to be, you know, I, I'm not going to be invited to these parties or whatever, because I don't drink. And I've never really experienced any of that. Like I've always anyway. found that I've always found that people just like, when you know who you are, like people just want to be around that, you mm -hmm. know, people want to be, um, you know, they, like you said, you know, you can tell when people kind of know when they're giving you an act or not, you know? And I think, um, you know, I've never really experienced, like I love television and I love entertainment and I feel like, sure, there's the people that you can tell are full of it and they're just trying to, you know, they're just wheeling and dealing and they've got ulterior motives and all these things. And, but for the most part, a lot of people are very passionate about telling great stories and they really want to, um, you know, help other people and tell powerful, you know, stories and, so I don't know. I, I guess I think I'm kind of rambling a little bit because I think I, I missed a little bit of your of the question. But I think for me, um, yeah, I, I've never really felt I've never felt on the outs of the industry because I didn't, you know, drink or anything like that. If anything, it just made me able to connect with people in a different way because um, I'm so open with my story. You know, and I think that that has really helped me is like, you know, I'm a big believer in that, like secrets grow in the dark, you know, yeah. and it's like when I, you know, all, a lot of people that I work with, like they know that I'm, you know, they know I'm sober. They know that that's a, you know, a place that I'm really passionate about and I, I care a lot about. Um, and so I've never, you know, I've never shied away. I've never thought that I needed to like keep that quiet or. Uh, cause most of the time, and especially now, you know, when I, when I got sober, I was like 23, 22 or 23 oh, God. and like, there weren't a lot of other people that were, you know, like I, when I got sober in Detroit, there weren't a lot of young people, you know, there were some groups, but not a ton, okay. but like not a lot of people were reaching out, but like now I'm 32 and you know, substance abuse catches up with people as you go through life. And it's like it now, totally does. You know, now I feel like I get like, I love that I'm able to be of service to people because I'll get a lot of calls from people, whether it's people I went to high school with, whether it are, you know, people that hear me talk or a lot of times it's people in the industry, you know, I'll have people reach out to me and be like, Hey man, like, I know you're sober and like, I have a buddy that's really struggling and like, 
I don't know what to say to him. Like, I don't really know, like, would you talk to him? And it's like, I get so much out of that being able to be of service to other people. Um, and be, and like I said, being so open with my story and being able to connect with people, you know, the authenticity that you experience in recovery meetings is like something that I don't think a lot of people understand. Um, I, I have to remind myself not to take that for granted at times. Um, sure. Cause it's, it's, not such, like that it's not like that, you know, and, and sure. even I'll, I'll say this. So, uh, I had a, so I, I belong to a, a men's group out here in Los Angeles and we do a men's retreat, uh, once a, once a year. Cool. And there's a, uh, you know, we had a weekend and in that weekend, we talk a lot about like vulnerability and, and trying to get healing from things from the past that have kind of, uh, but it's, it's not a recovery group. So this is just like a, a, a guy's group, but nothing is retreat. not recovery based. But you. a couple of the guys that put it on, like we come from recovery backgrounds. So we try to create an environment where guys can feel confident to talk about different things and get some healing from it. And the crazy thing was, I remember the first time I'd ever gone, I remember leaving and feeling like good and bad. Like there were so many guys that got healing that weekend because they were finally in an environment where they were able to be authentic and vulnerable and talk about some things that they felt a lot of shame and guilt over. And then there was a moment where I realized like a lot of these dudes are getting this once a year. Like I, like I get to go to a meeting, I could go to a meeting every day if I want, you know? And it's like, it's such a blessing to be able to go and have safe places where you can go and share what's going on in your life and really just like get things off your chest, connect with other people. And that's another thing hearing, you know, I'm all for therapy. Like I, I think people should do therapy. Like you, if, if you need help, get help however you need to get it. Mm -hmm. But to me, there's something about group therapy, like in AA or any, you know, CR, any other type of groups, there's something about listening to other people as well, share what's going on in their lives to where you realize it's not all just about you. You know, my only issue at times with like, you know, one-on-one -on -one therapy is just, it's like, Hey, I'm going to tell my therapist about my problems. And it's all about yeah. me, and me and me and me, which is good. And it's needed. But I think there's something powerful also that happens when you realize like, yo, you're not the only effed up person in the world. Everyone is dealing with a lot of, a lot of people have stuff they're dealing with. And it just helps you be a little bit more compassion, compassionate and understand that. Um, I don't know. I'll let you jump in. I feel like I'm rambling a little bit now. So, yeah, but I, I'm maybe because again, an exercise that I do with this podcast is, is try to keep my mouth shut for yeah. some time because I, I just kind of like to talk and it's, it's always good to, to hear other opinions on things. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Uh, you have been in recovery, you said 10 years, right? Yeah. And it sounds like you're still very actively involved uh, with meetings and, mm -hmm. and with being involved in, in a, a group of recovering men and women. Uh, but usually you probably have a lot of men that you're really close to. Um, I don't talk about this very often. And I think now is probably as good a time as any, but it, it got to a point with me where I started feeling guilty because I was leaving meetings kind of tired of hearing about problems all the time. And I've heard that be said by other people. Um, but then I would, I would feel guilty because I didn't want to take my shit and like possibly pollute something else that is really helping somebody, you know? So yeah. I think I, I think I'm doing the right thing by it, which is kind of being in the corner and be like, Hey, look, if that's helping you, you do you. And like, however I can support you, that's fine. But over the years, um, I've gotten much more comfort, uh, really in gyms. It has kind of been like my form of, of meditation, really running. Yeah especially um, I recently started swimming and I do get to a point sometimes where um, not that I feel isolated because I have some really, really close relationships and like people always know where I'm at, you know, but where I feel like I'm not like participating in this, uh, this energy that gave so much to me, you know? And so I kind of have like this weird 
push and pull in my mind where I don't want to dive into something and be sitting there and be kind of brooding just because of, of me. But at the same time, I feel guilty for not like giving back to a thing sure. that, that gave so much to me. And, um, you know, I, I guess it's been about a, well, it's not completely true. I, I'll probably hit like one meeting a month, I would yeah. say. And it's usually because somebody invites me or something. Um, but it's not something that I, I do actively anymore. And for the people who listen to this, it's not something that I would like recommend to say like, I know a better way by any means. Like, I don't, yeah. I don't know anything. <laughs> like, I really mean that. Like, I don't know anything. I just, uh, I feel really, really good with where I'm at right now. And I kind of don't want to ruin it, you know? Yeah. Like, I'm scared to, to fuck with it too much. But hearing you and sort of the obvious passion that you still have for being connected, that's the word, right? Because that's what you are when you're involved in that stuff. Like, you're connected and you're a, a part of. Um, it's it's making me feel like I, I'm missing out a little bit. I. I don't know if it's it's missing out. You know, I, I think for me, I remember when I first got to AA and I remember seeing somebody take, it was like probably in my first month. And I remember seeing a guy take a chip for 25 years. And in my head, I thought, if I'm here in 25 years, dude, this shit doesn't work. You know, like I remember thinking that, you know, and then I did start to see that it was one of those things where, you know, it was about, you know, I had to realize like, you know, if I'm, if no one would have been here for my first meeting, like, there wouldn't have been anyone here. So I need to be there for other people. Um, But I will say, you know, I, and I feel you on like the problems, right? Like when people get into the drunk logs and like, they want to just, you can always tell when someone still is getting validation from how, how awful they made things. You know, Mm -hmm. you can tell when they tell a story and they're like, Hey, let me tell you this story about all the women I had. I'm so bad, but let me, you know, and it's like, dude, I'm a bigger scumbag than you are. Yeah. But so I, so actually my, my home group that I go to every, every Tuesday, um, is it's called a solutions meeting and we go around and guys just only talk about what they did for a solution, That's cool. you know? So it's guys go around and it's like, you know, today I, you know, I woke up, um, you know, and the cool thing with a lot of it is like, when you see guys that it's the same thing, it's consistency, you know, like yeah. for me, it's like, you know, I wake up, uh, I wake up. I go to the bathroom, I make my bed, I hit my knees and I pray. I go through my mission statement. I go through my affirmations list. Um, I go through my prayers. Uh, I go through my, you know, prayer lists. I, you know, I have this whole little routine I go through, you know, I do, I do 50, 50 sit-ups and I do 25 push-ups, and then I start my day. And it's like, I do the same thing every day. Um, and it's good to hear other guys talk about the things that they're doing that help, uh, that are, you know, that are helping them stay sober and not just about like always talking about like the the drunk logs or 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 the problems and and I I will say it definitely changed for me because I used to be like I go to meetings but I never was consistent at the meetings I'd go to so I would like jump around I was very selfish with I'd go when I needed it I didn't really I wasn't part of it I wasn't you know I would just go in and when I needed a meeting I'd go to one but I'd always kind of jump around and but something definitely switched when I got a home group. And when I started to actually show up on a consistent basis, because you started, it was like, not only was it consistent for me, but there was something about being able to see other people on a consistent basis. And you saw the ups and the downs. You'd see the week when Mikey was really doing a great job and was on high on fire. And then you saw when, you know, his, his mom got sick and how he, stuck to the, you know, how he, how he got through it. And it's like, you're seeing these, you're, you're seeing guys that are succeeding and doing it, you know? Um, and I, I think that that was something that I've always really enjoyed is being able to see guys that have, you know, men and women that are consistent. Cause I think consistency is such a difficult, for sure. you know, it's so necessary for life, but it's like one of the things that people are, we're so scattered a lot of the times. Um, so, you know, for you, man, I don't know if it's, you know, that you're missing out. I think you're, you know, you have, uh, you have outlets in other areas too. You know, I think that's mm-hmm. it. It's like we find, you know, we we talked briefly about, you know, I think one of the, you know, a problem that I see a lot of times in the rooms of of AA or, or other things is, you know, when you first get sober 
it's this idea of like, all you have to do is not drink. That's it. Like, just don't drink today. And like, very, yeah, that's it. That one, one thing, you know, yeah. but then on a long enough timeline, like at a certain point, like there needs to be, at least I believe there has to be something more. There needs to be a moment when you start to either look at a new mission for life, a new passion. Uh, what do you want your life to be about? Because I know personally, mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't think that my life, I don't think my life's purpose purpose was for me to have an issue with alcohol when I was younger and then for me to get over it. And then for, and that's it. Like, I think that there's that's so, so much more there's so, you know, and that's just part of the story. And I think that that's something that's so key is like for us all, whether we're in recovery, whether we're not in recovery, just people in general, like they say the meaning of life is finding meaning in your life. It's like being able to find something that is, uh, that is important to you that you can, that you can get up and do every single day with passion. Cause that's how we, you know, that's how we stay a lot, you know, like that's, yeah, that's how we like continue to, it, it's so easy. It's so easy to let this world jade us and beat yeah. us down. And I hate, you know, one of the, one of the phrases I hate is like, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Like, no, because the truth Not is always. if that were true, then we would have the strongest 87 year old people walking around the planet. Like yeah. they would be like <laughs> the strongest. They'd be the most like, you know, emo- emotionally intelligent. They'd be the most caring. They'd be more you know, like, no, like life beats people up. Like mm-hmm. beats people up and beats them down and they never, and a lot of people are just existing and they're just moseying on through life. And it's like, no, you have to do the work. Like if you want to have, you know, I love this one for this one saying, and it's like, you know, if you, uh, if you do the things that others won't do, you get to have what others won't have. And it's like, it's easy to just do the bare minimum. It's easy to stay in your comfort zone. It's easy to not, really put yourself out there and to go for things. It's easy. It's comfortable. It, it is. And that's why most people do it, you know? And so I think it's one of yeah. those things where we all have to find personally, like, what is it that like sets us on fire? Like, what is it that like, and for some people it's, it's art and it's, and there's nothing wrong with it being art. Some people it's music. Some people it's movies. Some people it's just wanting to go and be the best dad that they can be. It's like, it, it's, it's not for anyone else to judge, but as individuals, I think we all need to have that moment where we stop and, and we say, I love what you talked about earlier with identity. It's like, what yeah. is my identity? What, what do I want to make this my life about? Like these 70 years that I'm going to get, what do I want to make them about? You know? Um, and I think that that's a really good question is like, what, what do you want? Like when I, you know, I guess for me, I've been, so a part of my story was when I was, when I was coming up, um, you know, I had the normal anxieties of a kid of wanting to fit in, blah, 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 blah. And and that led to me drinking. But then what really kicked off things for me. So when I was, when I was 14, my mother was diagnosed with cancer. When I was 15, she passed away. Uh, so at, you know, a week before my 16th birthday, my mother was gone. And so I had this, you know, this idea and I had this run in with death. And so I think, you know, for me, you know, death has always been kind of, you know, you hear it, you know, death is the great equalizer or whatever, all these things. But like, I guess I've always kind of had this idea of like thinking about in other people, in other motivational speakers, people talk, they always talk about this moment. Like if you were at your, on your deathbed and you're looking back, like that's not the time that you can do anything about your regrets. Yeah. The time is now like the time with, you know, like, but I also think I have to think about like, you know, if I were on my deathbed, what are the things that I haven't done? What, what are the, where are the areas of life I would feel regret, you know, for not going for? And I try to set my life up to where I don't want to, I don't want any regrets. When that moment comes, when I'm lying on my deathbed, when the end is there, I want to know that I can look back and be like, you know what, you know, sure. I didn't do it perfectly. Um, but I lived my life in a way that I can be proud of right now. And I, and I made an impact on people. And there's the, you know, that there's a lot of guys that have the, uh, the, the, uh, funeral test or they say, they're like, you know, if you were at your funeral, what would you want people to say? And for me, like if I before. were, if I were and you, you can't be codependent about it, right. You can't just be focused yeah. on what other people say. But if I were to be honest, if I'm at my, if my funeral is there and everyone's there and they go, you know what, man, let me tell you, Phil, Phil was one hell of a TV producer to me, that would be a failure. Mm -hmm. That would not be, if that's what I'm known for, 
when I when my life comes to an end is being a TV producer. That that's not what I want to. That's not how I want my life to be. When I think about what I want people to feel about me when I'm gone, you know, I I, I knew I want people to say like I knew that when I called Phil, Phil would pick up the phone. I knew that yeah. Phil would talk with me when I needed to be there. I knew that Phil would always, you know, he'd always try to find a way to make me feel good. Um, you know, when I when I think about those things and I sit and I write those things out and like you said, journaling and really get intentional about what type of a life do we want to have and what do we want to lead and who do we want to be for ourselves and for other people. And I, the funny thing is, as I really started to define those things, it made life a lot easier, actually, because it was like having that mission statement. It was like, sure. I picked the North Star and I'm heading towards it. Yeah. And, and it just made life, you know, it was like the discipline of sitting and doing that, the discipline of making decisions on who I wanted to be. That discipline brought me freedom. Uh, Jocko quote. Yeah. Oh, dude, I love Jocko. He's great. Yeah, he's cool. Uh, you've uh, you've given me a lot to think about, man. And I think this conversation was kind of perfect timing for me because uh, I don't have these kind of conversations about like my own. Th- there's always like an underlying theme in my podcast, just because a lot of the people that I know and I respect, both men and women, uh, have some kind of like trouble that they've gotten through. And so it seems to come up a lot. Uh, But with that being said, I don't think I've ever had such like a direct conversation about recovery and sobriety in this way on the show. And I, uh, I commend you for all the work that you've done. I think you're going to go really far with uh, with how you you. want to be, be remembered. Um, All right. Well, before we head out, I want to make sure I give you a chance to tell people where they can find more about you. And oh, totally, uh, yeah. Mind, I'm going to link everything up on the show notes of the blog article. But even still, um, where 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 can they learn about you? Where can they find out more about your work? Yeah, definitely. So uh, one of the easiest ways is you guys can always go to my website. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, like anybody in the 21st century, we all have websites now. And uh, so it's philipandrew.co. Uh, they ran out of the M's, so I had to do the dot .co. <laughs> and, um, so yeah, it's uh, P-H-I-L-L-I-P, Andrew, A-N-D-R-E-W, uh, dot .co. And I have, you know, I have my blog there that I try to post on Mondays and Thursdays. Um, I do like an audio recording of the blog. Um, I also have all my information in there in terms of, you know, if you wanted to do any, any type of coaching or, um, you know, I'm available to come and speak in different places uh, across the country when I have time when I'm not on shows. Uh, and I also have some links to, you know, some of the TV shows I've done. You know, I've worked on shows like yeah, I'll Undercover. link that too because I know yeah, a lot of like, people are going to be interested in that. Yeah, I've done like, uh, you know, Total Divas on the E Network with the WWE, and you know, worked on uh, Undercover Boss on CBS, and um, you oh, know, worked God, on a handful. I can't wait to tell my girl about that. She's fucking obsessed with that show. Oh, nice. Yes, yeah, so I worked on. <laughs> se- yeah, I worked on seasons uh, one, one, two, and four of Undercover Boss, and um, cool. and so yeah, I mean, that's really it. I mean. Let me just say, man, I greatly appreciate you letting me come on and, and just talk. Oh, no and, and I think it's awesome that, um, you know, that you've you've created such an amazing um, outlet and place online, you know. And I think it's I think when we're in when we're in it, you know, when we're in recovery and in in sober life, I think it's easy after a while. You you need, you meet a lot of people that are sober. And, and so it starts to break that wall down and, and you forget that the stigma still exists out yeah. there, you know, and you forget that a lot of people still, as I did when I got to AA, have that image of an alcoholic that is a dude with a trench coat and a bottle of $2 bourbon, uh, you know, under living underneath a, a freeway overpass. And I think when we, every single time that there's one more podcast or another conversation or another video or another website or another blog that that normalizes having issues with substance abuse and alcohol like it like not only does it give people an outlet like it legitimate where it saves lives man like there are people yeah. that you know like the the I won't dive into all of it but we all know like the drug epi- epidemic right now the amount of overdoses the people that are dying in, in drinking and driving accidents like people are losing their lives like this is ser- like it is serious stuff 
And it's important that people know that there are other people out there that care and want to love them and want to be supportive of them. And it's like, and they're strangers. And so like, dude, I really, I really commend you for just the work that you have done with, with your site, with your blog, with the podcast and just giving, you know, giving people not only an outlet to tell their stories, but also giving people an outlet for them to hear the stories of others. If they don't have the ability to always get to a meeting or, or just to see that, Thank you. just to see that there's people out there that are living sober lives successfully. Um, Thank you. And that, yeah. that does mean a lot to me. I, I always finish up when people comment on sober nation and, you know, sober com and just the huge uh, outlet that we have created. I always make a point to mention that the reason why it was, why it, it reaches a lot of people is because I never made it about me. It's yeah. just an open platform for people to kind of tell their stories and express their ideas. And, and I think that's, I think that's the important, the important thing that it does and the reason why, why it's done well. So your compliments do mean the world to me. Thank you so much again for, hey, for showing you, up man. and taking this time. I know that you just had, had your surgery. And so yeah, two days ago. Um, I, yeah, yeah. 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 This, it was good. I think it, it gave it slowed me down a I've little bit. I've had that surgery. Huh? I, I've had that surgery before. It hurts, but it's it's over before you know it. Yeah. I feel like I'm on I feel like I'm on the other side of it now. I feel like I'm good. on the other side of it. So yeah. Good man. Uh, well, uh, well, thanks again. Thanks. Hey, thank you very much, dude. I appreciate it. If you could leave me a review and a comment on iTunes, that's the best thing you can do to support the show. So appreciate your time, buddy. I'll talk to you later. Thank you, man. Bye, guys.